Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the GAA All Ireland Senior Hurling Championship and GAA Legends Tour Series of Crow Park. Hashtag Hurling to the Core. Hello and welcome to the Throw In Independent Dolly's GA podcast in association with Board Gosh Energy. I'm Will Sodery. Delighted to be joined as always by Michael Verney. Michael, hello. How are you, Will? I don't know about you. I, I'm really still taking breaths here, trying to recover from, from the weekend. It was just, uh, it was a weekend to behold on the Harlem front. Oh, it was funny. Like, a, you know, obviously the championship kicked off last weekend, but I, or the weekend before last, but I felt like the one just gone by was going to f- finally hit championship pace. I just thought there was some absolutely cracking games with the hurling, as you mentioned on the Saturday. Even trying to keep up with all the sport going on generally on Saturday w- w- was a tough one between the Euros, the Lions, and the hurling all kicking off. Yeah, and going- you haven't even mentioned Wimbledon as well. Like, just, it's so easy to, to get lost in it. But yeah, but my, my hurling Saturday started at. 11 o'clock, I drove down to Port Leash to see the Offaly Miners play, unfortunately, beaten by, uh, beaten by Kilkenny in the Leinster Minor final. Then it rolls over to the first game in Crow Park, then it rolls over to the Extra Time Classic in Crow Park, and then it rolls over to Saturday evening as well. Yeah, it was, uh, and that's not even to mention yesterday, which we'll get into, which we'll get into properly at a later stages. Yeah, it was a phenomenal weekend. Yeah, no, it was absolutely brilliant. And we're going to be joined by Dick Clerk in, in a little bit to discuss the football weekend. But first, I'm delighted to have John Milan and Roy Curtis here to talk hurling on the Throne Podcast in association with Board Gosh Energy. Guys, how are things? Very good, Will, and you? Yeah, very good. Thanks. Uh, great to have you both on. A uh, very exciting weekend of hurling, John. I might go to you first. It's hard to know where to start. Obviously, we have a, that refereeing controversy that we might touch on a little later. But I think given the, the seismic results on Saturday in Galway, Dublin, it's probably a good place to start there. Obviously, Galway coming in probably is the number two uh, favourites after Limerick for the All-Ireland. Dublin has completely tore up the script. I don't think anyone really saw it coming. To be fair, you did hint at maybe a possible upset in your column on Saturday, but I think you stopped just short about tipping it. But what did you make of the game? It was a, it was a massive result for Dublin. Yeah, well, who, who would have foreseen it? Will, uh, I was at the Dublin Antrim game and I was doing the radio that day and I did predict back then that Dublin would take a scalp in the championship this year. But I most certainly didn't think it was going to be against Galway, who who are being talked up as being the, the nearest contenders to uh, dethroning Limerick and, and, and pushing on and winning Lee McCarthy. And it just goes to signify how big a result it has been for, for, for Maddie Kenny and this Dublin team. And it's just blown the whole championship wide open. And now all of a sudden we have a, we have a hurling, all hurling qualifiers that, you know, it's just a, a, a hotbed and I suppose the most frustrating thing for, for me any is because I actually tipped Dublin to uh, to finish top of division division one, I think it was one A. And a lot of people are suggesting, well, why would you why would you pick Dublin? And last year I tipped them against Cork in the qualifiers and they left me down. And I was tipping them throughout this the league campaign I tipped them against Wexford I tipped them to beat the first day out against Kilkenny and I was kind of losing I was kind of losing a bit of heart and I was kind of saying Jesus the, the, the one time you tip them and they go and let you down and then then the opposite of that then the time that you don't tip them you know and they go and do that Saturday you now the big thing for Dublin now is can they back it up Dublin are kind of a team that when you least expect them, they come and give a big performance. But when the pressure comes on, as we've seen in the past, you know, they can they can blow up a small bit. So now, you know, all the pressure is going to be on them. Can they, can they win their first Leinster title uh, since, since, since 2013? And a lot will depend on, on, the, on the injury to Owen O'Donnell. Will he be okay? Because I think he's key. If Dublin are going to get over the line and, and, and win their first Leinster title since 2013, Owen O'Donnell has to be on the field. But you know, to a man, they were they were they were they were brilliant, they were well set up, they came with a game plan, their half forward line were excellent, crummy, Donald Burke, Suckliffe, who's play who's in the form of his life. Then at the back you had Owen O'Donnell, Keno Callan. Uh, Rush was 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 brilliant at, at, at number six. You had Connor back, Connor Burke coming in then and and uh, hoovering up, you know, kind of playing playing that sweeper role. And they were full value for the win. And, and Galway got what they deserved. Galway, I thought there was a small bit of what would I call it arrogance, but I think they kind of 
underestimated, you know, how good Dublin are. And I don't think they, they possibly showed Dublin enough respect. And that was evident from the start, where I just think uh, they felt that, look, no matter what happens, we're going to win this match. And you could see it from, 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 from the get-go. You know, all those missed goal opportunities didn't have a score on the board since, since the 14th minute. And you could just see what was going to, what was going to potentially happen. And, you know, uh, Dublin got ahead of them. You know, their, their scoring efficiency was, was top class. And once, once the game went on, panic hurling started to set in. And, and, you know, when panic hurling starts to set in, the underdog, you know, starts to believe in themselves. And uh, that's what happened. Panic hurling set in and, and Galway were, were chasing the game. They were trying to force the, force, force the issue. And uh, Dublin then got the, got, got, got the crucial goal then with Crummy. And, uh, you know, they, they just drove on and they were full value for the win. Yeah, Roy, like, I know you were at Croke Park. You know, what, what, what does this mean for Dublin Hurling? Obviously, as John says, it's eventually final to be played. It's obviously they, they'd love to get, you know, some silverware. But at the same time, taking a big scab in Croke Park as well, the last time they beat Galway, it was maybe a tighter confluence of Parnell Park, perhaps more suited to that kind of upset result. When you go to Croke Park and you beat a team like Galway, that's massive for Dublin Hurling. It's It's huge. I mean, I, I ran into Liam Rush later in the evening and you could see the relief oozing from them. This is something they really needed to do after that game against Leash two years ago was still sort of in there nagging at them, having beaten Galway. And I think they really felt that they were coming under Matty Kenny and that was such a huge setback. But to be in Crow Park was really, really interesting on Saturday because it was intoxicating. Um, it was an evening that really had everything. And then to have that shock result followed by a mesmerising game. But Dublin, Dublin were no fluke winners. I mean, as, as John said, there was, there was a strange lethargic nature to Galway's performance. They were going for goals within the first couple of minutes. Joe Canning uh, missed, missed two chances. Well, he had two chances brilliantly saved by Alan Nolan. Um, and Joe would go on to have seven wides in the game, which sort of is... One of the greatest players I've seen, you just don't expect to see that. But full credit to Dublin. And I mentioned Alan Nolan there. I know the weekend has been dominated by another Dublin goalkeeper. But Alan Nolan's performance really was spectacular. And it set, it set the tempo. He made three exceptional saves. His distribution was superb and was critical for the vital goal. He scored a point from his own 45 that really gave the team a lift at a vital time. And you could see big players rising. Um, Danny Sutcliffe, I mean, it's hard to believe. It's I think it's eight years since Danny won his All Star as a as a bright young thing. Um, he had gone off to America and played in New York for a while. It seemed he might be lost to Dublin, but when he's in that sort of form, he's a thoroughbred athlete. He was eating up the ground, and the physicality and intensity of Dublin really caught up Galway because if Galway had slept walk into the game, you can't just press that alarm. Dublin were reducing Crow Park's dimensions to phone box size. I mean, they were closing in on guys, not giving them time. Um, and even their response to Conor Whelan's goal, when he scored that goal, I thought, here come Galway now. But Dublin responded with confidence. They had absolute faith in their game plan. There was real method to what they did. And they were fully deserving winners. And they have a fighter's chance against Kilkenny. Again, I think, I think the fullback issue is vital because when we saw what what both Owen Cody and TJ Reid were, were capable of. The notion of going in without Owen O'Donnell is a fairly scary one, I think. Yeah, and as you mentioned, they couldn't back it up two years ago when they went to lose to the Leash. So it'll be really interesting to see how they respond to this, such a big victory uh, in two weeks' time. But Michael, so from a Galway perspective, you know, as we mentioned, they were coming in in a really good place. It looked like second favourites to Limerick. People thought they were viable All-Ireland contenders. Did, like, is, is there All-Ireland chances? Are, are, they, are they done for you now? Or do you think they can rebuild? Like, what... What do you yeah. Do that? yeah, it's a difficult one, depending on how the draw um, transpires next Monday. If they want to get to an All Ireland final uh, or win an All Ireland final, they could potentially have to play five games in six weeks, which is going to be real difficult. And as John says, it's a real shark tank in the qualifiers this year. Um, it was the first time in, you know, probably just when even John was finishing up with Waterford, uh, Galway would have been, I don't know if wishy washy is the word, but like they would have been been seen as almost like the arsenal of, of Hurling, that they can produce something unbelievably good 
but also produce something unbelievably bad. And you don't really, you didn't really know what you were going to get on a given day with Galway. And this is the first time in a long time that that has happened in a, in a big kind of championship game. Like that game two years ago in Parnell Park, like that, they were in that game. That just game just turned on probably Crummy's two goals. Whereas the other day, uh, like if you'd said that Galway had only scored 114, 15 scores, or like they, they scored 313 in one half against Wa- against Waterford in the league. So it's just really, really hard to, to fathom that. Like I wonder, did the did the score and record uh, play on Joe Canning's mind at all? Um, I I, it, I did think it was it was a weird decision to go for a goal from that twenty one, which wasn't straight in front of the goal. I thought that was strange. Um, some of his wides, I think he had 10, 10 missed scoring chances, which is just really really unlike him. But he wasn't the only one. There were Galway were doing things that just were really really you know uncharacteristic for them all over the pitch. Um, even Dottie Burke was very quiet. Their, their, the half-back line that, that John would have talked about in his column on Saturday, that kind of much-vaunted half-back line, very, very quiet, couldn't get into the game. Um, so they're left in a really, really tough spot now. And on the flip side of that, you know, if you'd said three weeks ago, you know, there was probably a lot of people you know, all over Dublin, Hurling, and what the condition it was in, and why haven't they done this, and why haven't they done that. Now, all of a sudden, they have a Leinster under-20 title under the belts. They're in an All-Ireland under-20 final. They're in a, a Leinster senior final. I have a chance of winning, you know, their first Leinster in eight years. So, I, I, I think it's, 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 it's brilliant for the championship because we needed an upset, you know. People were almost saying, you know, it's Dublin and Kerry in football, and it's Limerick and Galway in Hurling, and, and that's it. And I just would love to... I, I, I'm delighted that any naysayers of the small ball have been put firmly back in their box over the last, you know, 48 hours because, you know, fair enough that things were a bit off in the first couple of games in the league. Things were always going to settle down and, like, between the two games in Crow Park and, you know, maybe Saturday evening wasn't unbelievable, but yesterday down in Limerick had everything you want in a championship game. So, all these people uh, trying to change Hurling um, unnecessarily uh, should probably step back and just appreciate what we have. Yeah, and just on Galway, Conor McKeown tallied that they only had six points from 22 scoring chances in the first half, which really drives home just how kind of wasteful they were. And as you mentioned, there was a lot made of maybe the need to get goals if you want to ultimately beat Limerick. So perhaps that was in the back of their mind, holding that goal scoring instinct. And, and John, I suppose the other game of Croke Park was, you know, an absolute cracker as well. for Kenny Wexford, so many different momentum swings, even an extra time alone, it looked like Wexford had gone on top with the penalty. And then Kenny battled back, you know, Walter Walsh getting that key goal. You know, what, what did you make of the game? Yeah, look, I think when when both managers reflect on, on, on the game, I think from Wexford's point of view and Dave Sherry's point of view, particularly after Dublin lost, or particularly after Galway lost to, uh, to Dublin, he reflect on it. And you could see it in his body language after the match that... This is it was a goal and opportunity missed to uh, not alone win the match, but uh, to to push on and, and possibly win uh, his 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 second Leinster title in in three years. Uh, but look, it was an, an unbelievable game of game of hurling. But look, anyone that had any question marks coming into this match about Cody about Kilkenny, they got all their answers the the the, the weekend. Uh, when I when I seen the team and I seen there was a cut, three changes on on the Kilkenny team, I was kind of saying Cody doesn't deal with dummy teams and then he he pulls in pulls in brings in three three guys, and I was kind of saying to my own mind I was saying like the team that he originally had picked is a stronger team than the team that he uh, ch- changed, but. He obviously had, he obviously had a plan, and, and the plan was to, to to offload the bench. And I think when when with with the result, I think that the difference between both benches was was probably the difference in the end. You know, you know, you look at the contribute what what the Kilkenny defense contributed uh, in that period when when they came on. I think they, they scored one eight, and you're looking at the caliber of players that were were coming off the bench. You're talking Walter Welch. You know, uh, Killian Killian Buckley. Uh, you know who else? I'm just going to do it here. James you know, Maher is brilliant as well. Yeah, James Maher, Connor Fogarty. Uh, you know Bergen. You know high quality, high quality players com- com- coming off the coming off the the bench. Will um, and look, TJ Reid, 34 years of age, 
I mean, you've seen lads going down with cramp near the end, and TJ Reid was was uh, was still going. Incredible stuff. But one thing you get with a, with, a, with a Cody team, you know, you get an honest effort. You know what you're going to get? They're going to be difficult to beat. They're going to turn up no matter what, what caliber of players they have available to them. You know, once Cody's on the line, you know, you'll get a good, honest, honest effort. And that's what, you know, they brought to the table the weekend. And there they are now. They're in a Lensa final. Will... They're one game away from being in an, in an order in semi-final and, you know, they'll fancy their chances in the Lensa final. And, and if they get into a semi-final, you know, as I said, Cody's record is, uh, he's, it's very good in semi-finals and you, you just can't, you can't, you can't write them off. You just can't write them off. Yeah, and uh, even though Kenny were the victors on the day, Roy, I suppose for Wexford, they did salvage a bit of pride considering how 2020 had gone so pear-shaped for them and even like reading Davy Fitz's comments after the game, he he seemed obviously not pleased because they were beaten, but at least that they kind of returned to maybe more of their 2019 vintage when they were very, very close to winning an All-Ireland final or a semi-final. I thought they were heroic. Um, if you consider the aftertaste last year left and whether Davy should come back, had the momentum been lost, they put in a huge performance. I mean, it really was amazing to, to sit up in the Upper Hogan and watch an extra time. It was like there was a sniper. There were body after body going down. They had run themselves completely into the ground. Um, that's the style they play. They invest so much in, in moving short and, and running game. They had a couple of chances to, to put the game to put the game away. Conor McDonald and Lee Chin both had good chances. Lee Chin had done some incredible stuff, but will be kicking himself that he uh, that he hit the post when he did. And of course, then if if we didn't have Hawkeye, they would more, more than likely be in the Leinster final now. That that Owen Murphy um, save that that denied what was uh, a flicked goal almost of the quality of Richie Hogan's last year. So I think they'll feel that they've made big strides back toward 2019. The question of whether they can lift it after the huge intensity of effort they put in. I, I, I think John is right. Having seen Galway beaten, Davey would have really relished uh, a go at Dublin. And I think a couple of Dublin players, believe it or not, are actually happier to be playing Kilkenny than they are Wexford because Wexford's style of play um, sort of drives a few of the Dublin guys dotty where they think they actually have a chance of going toe-to-toe with Kilkenny. And even though Kilkenny vastly I would play them for much of the game last year. Dublin came with that late surge and and almost almost caught them. So for Wexford, I think it was ground gained, but a huge chance lost. Yeah, and that that's 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 interesting. Like like I'd like to ask the two lads, Roy and Verney, do you think they'll recover from it? Because I, I think it's it's going to be, I think it's going to be an uphill task. Uh, you know, going into this qualifiers, whether they're going to recover from that. You know, it's it's both physically but I think more mentally knowing that they had a serious opportunity to 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 get to the final and possibly win, win the Lens of the final and I just like to ask the question you know out of all the teams going into the qualifiers I think David Fitzgerald you know in in, in, in regards to trying to re-galvanise you know get him back up to it I think he 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 have a, he have a big big task of, of if, trying to get if you look what to, happened John in even if you look what happened in 2019 when they lost that game against Tip, it's probably taken them 18 months to fully recover mentally from that. Um, and I, I, I just saw how shattered they were physically. And I think that physical um, tiredness will mentally affect them as well. And the, the number of games you have to play in such a concentrated period of time now, if you're in those qualifiers, to try and make a season of it, I think it'll be intensely difficult for them. Yeah. yeah, I'd 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 go along with what Roy said there. It did take him a long time to overcome that 2019 setback, and there was a lot of um, there was a lot of probably shades of it. They didn't uh, they didn't utilize the extra man when they were 15 on 14. It didn't look like they had an extra man really. Uh, and when you look at what they're going to be facing, looking at the teams in the qualifiers: Cork, Clare, Waterford, Galway, Antrim, or Leash. Like outside of the winners of Antrim and Leash, they're like they're all awful games really to to be facing into. Uh, and I, I just don't think it was a good sign as well, bringing back on players that look knackered really coming off. They, they were they were physically spent coming back, coming off. And you looked at, at the likes of Harry Kyo, Joe O'Connor and a few more who were sitting there 100% fit and ready to go. 
And I, like with the best will in the world, there's no way they're they're going to be very unhappy. There's going to be a handful of lads really unhappy uh, in that squad that they didn't get in and tired bodies were back brought back in ahead of them. So I do think of all the teams that are going to find it difficult to turn around, I think probably I would agree with the lads and I think Wexford are going to be, it's going to be the most difficult task for them to turn around because it's just physically and emotionally exhausting. And you might laugh at me. I think the one fixture, if I was Davey Fitzgerald, I think, or possibly Brian Lone, I think for either manager, I will be looking for either either team to, to play each other. To, you know, to kind of get the sport back into the team. <laughs> honestly, honestly. Yeah, honestly. yeah, no, I'd agree. Yeah, I'd you agree, know, yeah. But I, I think the best fixture for, for either Wexford or Clare to get going again is for either to draw each other. Albeit what's after happening in the last couple of weeks and what's after happening throughout the course of the winter, I think it's the best fixture that, that either team could possibly get to kind of, you know, go again in this championship. Yeah, I think they need a UN peacekeeper rather than a referee for that one, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I think the draw next Monday as well. It's, it's such a vital draw for the rest of this championship. It'll be fascinating to see how it all comes out. And Michael, you know, switching to Munster, Tipperary Clare yesterday probably produced a talking point of the weekend. Subsequently, Tipperary only winning by four points in the end, but a key moment early in the second half where referee James Owens gave a sim bin and a penalty for a challenge that was out on the left touchline. It's caused huge controversy. Eamon Sweeney writing in today's paper said he thought it was the worst refereeing decision in the history of the GA. You know, you can debate that, but certainly it was a very controversial call. Brian no one wasn't happy. Um, for you, is that the big takeaway from the game? Like, was that the decisive moment? Yeah, no, to me, that, that turned the game completely. Um, there was a graphic going around last night showing that where the, where the foul occurred, it was closer to the, the, the Ennis Road, like actually physically on the Ennis Road outside the ground, closer to that than it was to the to the Clare goal, which is just, it's, it's a bizarre, really. Um, I would, we had serious reservations about the same being, being brought in exactly for reasons like this. Whatever about when a referee makes a mistake, when a referee makes a mistake, it should not you know, totally define a season and define a game. And this has, uh, like, if that was given as a penalty and, you know, the, the penalty uh, area that you can, you know, foul inside is increased and that's given as a penalty, okay, that's bad, that's a bad mistake and it's a goal conceded. But to have lost somebody for 10 minutes within that time because of a mistake as well as conceding a goal and then they, they lose that period, the Aid McCarthy's off the pitch 2-4 to 2 points, it, it's just madness really and... Um, as Brian Lowen said it after, I, I did not see one person that thought that that was a penalty or, or a sim bin. Not, not one. There were at least three bodies go, definitely going to be back in Jake Morris's way uh, for him to get a goal. And I don't even think he would have had a goal in his mind. Like he, I think he would have been literally physically met with either Cotton Malone or there was one other player in the picture there. It's, it's an awful decision. Um, and I generally am a big fan of James Owens as a referee because he usually lets the game flow and that's the reason why he's got a lot of all Ireland's in recent years but that was just a really 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 bad call and uh, fairness to Brian Lone did very well to, to keep it together in that interview with RT after it was absolutely captivating viewing because you literally thought he was going to explode at any second and in fairness to him he was, a, he was able to hold it together I had one fella tag me on Twitter and said that Brian Lone should have thrown on the red helmet and headed into the referee's room uh, after, after the game and I'd say I'd say he was tempted to but it, it was a really really difficult one you know the way um, you know Owen Murphy was sent to the sin bin uh, that was okay everybody knew that Owen Murphy deserved to be sent to the sin bin and Kilkenny were able to react to it or whatever Claire felt such an injustice and sometimes this happens again you can have the most unbelievable mental strength. But when something like that happens, you're literally for five minutes trying to realise like what actually happened there? We were a penalty. Uh, we're after conceding a goal from penalty, we're a man down. I, I don't even know what happened there. There was no way that was a, a goal. And then all of a sudden, Aver Quilligan gets his hands mixed up for a very, very soft Seamus Canlon goal. And the game is nearly over as a result of that. Uh, that that really changed the game. I think from a, a clear point of view, they have to make sure that like the ghost goal uh, defined Waterford season in 2018 they cannot let it define their season and they did so much good outside of that and even battled back at the end to make it a four point game when Tip probably should have been pulling away so there were a lot of really bright spots from Clare and uh, if, if history has shown us anything in the last few months Brian Lowen will have these boys steeled and ready to go again for the qualifiers and they'll have uh, they, uh, as somebody said to me like in order to be balanced you need to have a chip on both shoulders and I think they'll have chips on both shoulders going into the qualifiers because they'll feel 
uh, with all the negative commentary over the winter, uh, everybody down on top of them after the Antrim game, this decision here, it'll be, you know, the world against us and they'll be really, really trying to strike back. And I think they will too. Yeah, and the uh, uh, Tipperary are scored are two four to two points in that soon been period, so eight points, and they only uh, won by four. So Clare actually outscored them by four points for the remainder of the game. John, you know, from a t- like, is that penalty decision the big thing for you in that game, or do you look at Tipperary and think, oh, like, is there anything you like from them or, or going into a much final against Limerick? Well, I, I remember the f- I think it was the second podcast we done this year. And you asked you we were I think it came up about the the, the, the new rules and like about, about the sin bin. And I remember saying on the pod at the time of saying that, you know, a ten minute period with a sin bin, you know, the likes of a limerick, a tipperary, they could effectively win the match in in, in that in that time period. And you know, that's what happened, Jesse. Tip, you know, they, they hit Clare for 2-4 and I was at home and I was texting the lads and saying it was the one team you, you could ill afford to go down and play against with 14 men as Tipperary and you know that's evident from two years ago go back to the all Ireland final when Richie Hogan was sent off look at the damage they done you know when, when Kilkenny were, were, were down to were down to 14 men and now this is Kilkenny who can you know, who who we seen the weekend against Wexford, you know, were comfortably able to handle being down to down to 14 men, but not against Tipperary, the way they spray the ball around. Uh, and, and I was just saying in my own mind, you know, I think Verney is right. They kind of got caught up in the whole thing and they were, it kind of it kind of took them for six. In, instead of saying to themselves, well, right, it's the period of 10 minutes now. We're playing Tipperary, an unbelievable team who can do untold damage in, 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 in that in that in that time frame, they probably didn't manage those ten minutes the way they would have managed it any other time. But we got to take into account, you know, the emotions of of and and Pete, and they were probably taken back by the sin bin. But for me, it was it was it was it was an absolutely crazy call, an absolutely crazy call, and it effect it effectively ruined the match. And it was it was it was. The shot in the arm that Tipperary needed to push on and, and win, win, win the game. And it, it effectively was, was the winning of the game. Yeah, Roy, like, you know, if you do look at then Tipperary, you know, going out and winning this game, like, have you seen enough from them to think that they can win a Munster final against Limerick? Well, I thought there were elements of the play were very good, but you do have to place that decision at the centre of all your thinking because Claire, as you say, outscore them otherwise and we're leaving leading. Um, I think there was some very positive stuff from Tip. After after a very slow start, there was a, there was a lot of good stuff from Jake Morris. I thought Seamus Callan having taken a long time to get into the game, I thought he showed a couple of beautiful, beautiful touches. Paddy Marr was really struggling early on. He grew into the game. Dan McCormick had a massive game. We all know he's a big physical presence. He scored a couple of very good points. I suppose everything depends on Limerick's performance in a Munster final. Limerick are still standard setters. And I think it's it's interesting after Saturday the way they 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 won by eight points. They scored two goals. I mean, they only scored goals in one of their five games last year. And the consensus is that it was a long way from vintage. Limerick, a bit like the Dublin footballers, they are now placed on a different level and a different standard. Um Limerick were able to do that to Cork with um, Aaron Galan being held scoreless from play, with Garod Hegarty not scoring till the second half. So Limerick have a huge amount more to come, you would think. And guys like Kyle Hayes, such a phenomenal athlete. Keane Lynch has so much. I think this is probably that tip team's last <laughs> hurrah in, ten, in terms of really going at Limerick. So I think there'll be a huge, intense effort I think they have a chance. I think the weekend has shown. I think Dublin's victory over Galway gives everyone hope. It sort of removes that cloak of invincibility. And Limerick certainly didn't look invincible on Saturday. But on the other hand, looking like a team at 70%, maybe, they were still able to ultimately comfortably beat Cork, which is ominous, I think, for the rest. Yeah, John, I might give you the last word in the hurling. We're just up against it a little bit time-wise. You know, Limerick Cork, what, what, what was your read on that? As, as Roy said, Limerick getting the win, but probably not having to hit a top gear. 
Yeah, and look, I was at that match. I was I was very impressed by Cork. I thought the scoreline is not not a true reflection of of, of the effort that Cork uh, brought to the table on, on the night. Um, Nimrick most certainly won that at their best. I think for twenty eight minutes, you know, Cork were well on top, and then when Keane Lynch got that first score, he got two scores within the space of of, of three or four minutes. He set up Darrow Donovan's goal, and I think it's you know Keane Lynch is key. I think if if any of the teams going forward, even Tipperary, you know, a bit like Tony Kelly, if they if they can if he can curtail the influence of of Keane Lynch, you'll go you'll go a long way to 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 trying to beat this uh, this 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 Limerick team because you know his influence is just is just unbelievable. But look, uh, from a Limerick point of view, you know what can you say? Twenty wides still scored two twenty two. Going on to the Munster final, I think that game is going to be on in Cork, is it? Is it going yeah. to be on Cork? Yeah, I think it's going to be on in Cork. I would think Limerick are going to be are going to be strong favourites on, on what, what, what I see in the weekend. You know, Limerick know what they have to do to improve. And I think from a Tipperary point of view, they know what they're going to have to do to try and try and take down Limerick. But it's 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 going to be a fascinating game in two weeks, two weeks' time. From a Cork point of view, they're the one team I would like to face in the qualifiers. Uh, if they can get Spillane back, you know, uh, Cooper in the middle, I think that after finding a player in Jeremy Elric, I thought he was excellent the weekend. But, you know, for any of the teams like the Waterfords, uh, you know, Wexfords, from Waterford point of view, I know we have a great record from Car- against Cork, but they will be the one team I would, would like to avoid. And I, I think, you know, they'll have a big say in the championship uh, yet. But uh, Limerick, again, look, there's, there's still a team to be with, you know. Yeah, some intriguing provincial final matchups in that qualifier draw next Monday is, is probably like a game in itself. It's, it's so eagerly anticipated. But for the moment, John, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, what man. It's now time to turn our attention to football on the Throw On Podcast in association with Boy Gosh Energy. We'd like to have Dick Clark on with us. Dick, how are you? Good morning, Will. How are you keeping? Yeah, good, thanks. And I suppose is we're going to kick things off with Stephen Clucks. I know you're writing about it today. Second week in a row we're talking about him. We have... I suppose somehow slightly more and slightly less clarity on his future now that Desi Farrell has spoken about it. Um, it's a strange situation, isn't it? I suppose if he had just retired before the season, Dublin would have been probably, you know, with Evan Comerford coming through, they would have been able to, you know, move on maybe with, with a good option. But it's kind of in or out, will he, won't he commit? It, it's a strange position for the all Ireland champions to be in, considering he's the team captain or was until recently. Yeah, well, it, it's, it, it's strange for Dublin, the management, the players... It's strange for GA supporters as well because you know you want you don't want to be talking these things like these you know these things should be just done and dusted and dealt with behind the scenes and it's a very personal and individual thing for for Stephen and then any player that goes through this stage in their career in terms of retiring deciding to step in it's it's a difficult time to go through and I went through it and so you, you don't want it to be splashed around and God knows I don't want to be walking talk, talking about it in my column today that being said like Stephen Cluxon is the sort of eminent footballer of our generation and Dublin are the top team in our in our sport, if not in the country. So you can't not talk about it either because it's such a significant um it potentially it potentially could have such a significant impact on Dublin. And when they put in the performance that they did yesterday with all this in the background, it's difficult not to draw some sort of lines between the two and if Dublin's form does continue off there's some it, it's natural for us to think is there something going on there that we don't know about now at the same time it's an amateur sport and I see Paul Flynn tweeting that this shouldn't be dealt with in the public forum but listen we can't have it both ways you know either a GA is held up there as 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 the sort of the the top sport of the country and professionalism in terms of the publicity of players and everything around that is is wanted in other circles we can't just block this out either. So, you know, it, it has to be discussed. And it is, as you say, it is a bit strange, uh, to say the least. Yeah, Roy, I, guess we, I don't want to maybe spend too much time on it, considering we talked about it last week as well. But as, as Chick said, the preeminent player on the preeminent team of the last decade, it, it's got to be a talking point. And it's been interesting to see some of the views on it, like as Dick mentioned, Paul Flynn saying that he should be given time and space and it shouldn't be a, a big talking point. But at the same time, like for a team that kind of prides himself on their professionalism, it strikes me as a very unprofessional way to deal with such a big thing. You know, Desi Farrell not really sure whether his his captain or his best player is re- 
if is he available or is he not available? And I find it hard to see him being able to just walk back in halfway through a campaign when he hasn't been with the team for, for six months either. It probably wouldn't be good for Evan Comerford's development just to be told, OK, you have to go back to the subs bench because Stephen Cooks is back. It's, it's very strange for a team that has never really allowed stuff like this to, to, to maybe turn into a, a sideshow like this. It's unorthodox. But then if you look at Stephen's career, it's built on a rejection of orthodoxy. Um, he dances to his own drum. I've spoken to a number of players in recent days, and I don't think it's as much as a distraction to them. I think they've been operating for quite a while on the understanding that Stephen wouldn't be involved this year. Um, I know there was a meeting between Stephen and a member of Desi's backroom team last Wednesday that went on for a couple of hours. Um, and I think a line was probably drawn then. I think Stephen just simply doesn't want to make an announcement. And I think the, the management don't necessarily want to intrude on his right not to make an announcement. And I think that's part of what's going on. I think Dublin have absolute clarity on this. I think they they know and recognise uh, Stephen Cluxon is not going to be involved this year. I think what it is in, in us talking about Willie he, won't he, we're maybe um, missing that this is a genuinely monumental stop all the clocks moment. You're looking at a guy who by any metric um, is maybe the greatest or most influential, certainly, Gaelic football, and not just of this generation, but of any. If you look at impact, if you look at his aura, if you, if you look at how he transformed the game, um, he's on a different rung of a ladder to what anyone else has achieved. When this guy made his debut in 2001, it was the year a very boyish Brian O'Driscoll got that iconic Lions try in Brisbane. Um, it was a year before Saipan. It was two years before Roger Federer won his first major. Conal Callahan was four years of age. And here he is 18 months ago at the age of 37 winning footballer of the year. And he can be very much seen as father of the revolution in Dublin, both for um, his professionalism, his setting of standards, and also because he kicked the most iconic points in Dublin's story, um, that 2011 buzzer beater, that, that did for Kerry. And people forget Dublin hadn't won in All-Ireland in 16 years, had won in 28 years before that. If he'd missed, would all that have followed necessarily just have naturally occurred? Maybe not. So I think it's probably farewell to Cluxton and I'm happy to mark it that way. Um, externally, it can look like it's distracting Dublin, but internally, I think very much they're, they're in control of the situation. Yeah, that's a fair point. Like if they're on top of it, I suppose internally that's more important than, than the external noise. But it, it's just an interesting one. It was like a few years ago when Connolly was in or out, and it was just constantly every press conference Jim Gavin was asked about it. it it'll just be an interesting one to watch develop. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Roy touched on a word there. He, he's happy to leave it. At, I'm not so sure. I think people like you, Roy, who's a very passionate Dublin person, want to be able to properly recognise and almost deify Clucks, and if this is his time. And we're not able to do that. You, you, like he deserves so much credit, as you rightly just said there. But you can't almost do that now because you can't really do all that if there's a chance he might come back and it might just peter away. And I think that's probably unfortunate. But as you said, Roy, that's Stephen Stade. He probably he, would be uncomfortable with all of that. And if that's his want, well, so be it. He, he as, as you know, Dick, he has absolutely no interest in self-promotion. In fact, he rejects the notion of celebrity yeah, completely. He does. All the record-breaking stuff, it genuinely means very little to him. He was just always about preparing the next performance, being the best he can be. I suppose we live in an age of such celebrity and social media. It's so unusual to find a personality like that. He's almost a throwback to a different era. And I think Dublin are very sensitive to that in the way they're dealing with this. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of on-pitch stuff, Michael, like, they're started their seven in a row bid over the weekend. Probably one of the most unimpressive performances uh, across the, the seven, eight years they've been on the road. Like, what, what did you, I know, I suppose it wasn't, uh, you know, on, on, on TV, but we've been watching the highlights and reading about it. Like, what, what, did, what did you make of that of that display? Yeah, it was definitely off colour. You know, Karma Costello kicked a lot of wides. Uh, Dean Rock obviously, obviously wasn't, wasn't playing or didn't start anyway. Um, yeah, it was like, I was, ch I was chatting to someone from Wexford late last week and they just said like the, the Wilder Division 4 side that they had as good a chance as anyone in Leinster of putting it up to Dublin. And in fairness, the, traditionally over the last probably 12 to 13 years, they've done quite well against Dublin and looking back at that 2011 Leinster final. But I think probably we could focus on Dublin a lot and Dublin were definitely off colour. 
was a massive effort, massive shift from Wexford. Like if you'd said that they were going to be three points to two up at the first water break, like that's scarcely believable, really. I suppose it, w- attention is naturally going to be drawn to Cluxton and naturally going to be drawn to Dublin. And I think the spread was 23 or 24 points. So Wexford beat that quite easily. And I think you should probably focus on on their effort. They're obviously gone out of the championship now. But like no more than Carlo did uh, a few years ago when they played them, that was a, it was a massive effort from a Division One side coming up against the Games Elite, the best side in the history of Gaelic football. So uh, Dublin were off colour, but credit to, to Wexford. It was a massive, massive performance. And I think it was huge for like veterans, veteran guys like the likes of Brian Malone, the likes of Dottie Waters, uh, Martin O'Connor as well, centre-back. It was great for these guys. I and mean, just as I said, I was chatting to a few different Wexford people. They were, all, they were all mad to test themselves against the best, mad to test themselves against Brian Fenton. Um, and while people will, you know, question whether, you know, there should be tears or whatever, players love testing themselves against the best. And those Wexford players will take that performance with them to their graves. And in fairness, they were credit yesterday. Uh, no one could have predicted them that they would be as competitive as that for as long as they were. As I say, it's a pity, uh, you know, uh, it's been said a lot of times, but there's no backdoor to Wexford can't build on that. Because as you said, when Carlo frustrated Dublin, I think it was that 2017, they actually went on and they were able to build on it and, and get, I think, take a couple of scalps later in the summer in the back door. Uh, it was an interesting weekend for Leinster football. Generally, Dick, obviously, the other quarterfinals as well, Mead, big winners against Longford. I think Leash were leading by one at half time against Westmead and, and somehow lost by 16 points. Some second half display by Westmead and Kildare narrowly beating Offaly uh, uh, as well. So Dublin playing Mead in the semi final and, and Kildare playing Westmead. Like, anything else jump out to you from that province across the weekend? Yeah, me again sticking their head up as a potential challenger, but and no more so than than Kildare. But how often have we seen that over the last few years? The real test will be in two weeks' time whether Meath can properly compete. Like touching on what Michael said, it just shows you when a team goes out full bloodied effort with whatever they have in their legs on a given day, what what you can do. But so many teams just turn up, roll over no physicality, no intensity, and almost accept their fate before they go out. So, like, if Mead can show a bit of the heart and effort that, that a Wexford did at the weekend, with arguably more talent and ability in them, there's no reason that they can't, can't compete. But it's up to them to decide. Whether they want to step, step back and, you know, play a bit of tactical t- cat and mouse and think they can outthink a Dublin, they can't. They've got to just go in full, full-bloodied um, and see what that gets them. And then, possibly, it'll be likely a Kildare or a Westmead to do the same and see can some team in Leinster bring Dublin the whole way down the home straight and let them win a Leinster title um, on merit for, for, for uh, what do you mean by on merit in terms of having to put in some effort Yeah, um, because it'd be great to see I think everyone got a bit of a shot in the arm from Wexford that because of such a gulf you're really worried that it'd be another route like we had seen the previous week so it was really great to see him and I know Shane Roach there was, went to college with him when I was in DCU so it was great for him and the Wexford people that they signed off on such a positive note now I would say to Wexford what the heck were you doing in Division 4 and you just couldn't win a game you talk about building we're the Division 4 lads beat the teams you should be building and build and rightly get up to that level for the years to come like Offley have done but don't be turning up at one big day against Dublin you know, you know they should be doing better in Division 4 than they had been because obviously there's more in Wexford than what they showed in, 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 in the league yeah. Just on that Will I was, I was in uh, I was in Port East yesterday evening for Kildare Offley uh, I missed the opportunity for Offley uh, they, they were 4 3 up at the first water break, but should have been 5 or 6 up, probably a half time. They ate really bad wise. They dropped three balls short. Uh, Anton Sullivan missed a good goal opportunity. Owen Carroll missed a good goal opportunity after half time. And you could kind of sense that their goose was cooked at half time. That you know, when you've just missed too much and you just haven't taken advantage. Like they were awfully on the ball for large stages of that first half. Kildare then kicked on in the in the third quarter. Uh, Neil Flynn was brilliant, and he he got a lovely goal. Two lovely kind of two lovely dummies in there, and an Alan Brogan hop where he put the ball up real high as well. Um, brilliant goal, and they needed someone like that to step up because they were struggling a good bit. Um, it's obviously missing Daniel Flynn. He wasn't on the twenty six. He's expected to be back fit for the semi final against Westmead. They're going to need to improve again, but I think key for them is. Uh, Mead hit them for five goals in the second half of the Leicester semi-final last year and they've conceded two goals in their five competitive games since then. So they've set out their stall to be really defensively robust and hard to break down at the back. And in fairness, they're making a good, they're making a good fist at that. I think they wanted to be solid at the back first 
And I think the the attack and play will come from their point of view. Like it, it's an absolute uh, godsend to be avoiding Dublin and to have the chance to to build again. He Jack O'Connor said last night he had to mind lads for the last three weeks because they've had that many injuries and like that's a that's a disastrous situation to be going into a championship game undercooked. So you'd be expecting better from them against Westmead and it's a glorious opportunity for the two of them to, to kick on. And from just from Westmead's point of view, that's a huge score to be putting up against Leash and a big turnaround, especially con- considering they're missing Kieran Martin, who's one of their best players and definitely one of the, the fulcrums of their attack. So yeah, a, gr- a great opportunity for the two of them. And I echo what Dick says as well. Um, so many teams are mentally beaten before they go out to play Dublin and you would really have serious uh, reservations and questions hanging over me to kind of going into that semi-final. Are they going to be spooked again even before the ball is thrown up? Yeah, Roy, like, would you give me the, a chance of, of, you know, keeping it close, as Dick was saying, to maybe getting towards the end with the game still in the melting pot, which hasn't happened in Leinster since, I don't know, the 2012 Leinster final, potentially. Um, you know, the Leinster final last year, <laughs> there was a few people saying that, that maybe Meath could give the Dublin a good game. It turned out to probably be as straightforward a victory as they've had over me in quite a while. Like, after a confidence-boosting win, like beating Longford by 22 points, people were tipping potentially an upset there going into it. Uh, do you see any hope for them against Dublin and even making it a competitive game? My view would be very much shaded by last year. They were competitive against Dublin in a league game last year. And then in the two games before they played Dublin, um, in Leinster. They scored 12 goals in seven against Wicklow and five against Kildare. And they came in with real momentum and were absolutely blown away. So although yesterday was a huge step in the right direction, there have been a lot of problems in the county. You had the Bernard Flynn situation. Um, as you say, uh, two, two Mead friends of mine were telling me to back Longford at 7-1 to one before the game. So there was a feeling there that they were very much vulnerable. So yes, it's a step forward, but they came in on even greater momentum, I feel, last year. I suppose the one thing they'll take a lot from is Wexford's performance and is the fact that Dublin have some serious issues, which maybe the Cluxton stuff is actually masking defensively. Um, they've lost John Small. Um, they lost Robbie McDade yesterday, and I would suggest he could be gone for the season. I'd be staggered if he played against me. Johnny Cooper has had injury situations with Jack McCaffrey gone, with James McCaffrey or with James McCarthy playing midfield, they're defensively very vulnerable relative to other positions in the in in the fields. They haven't had the supply chain coming through. Owen Merchant was another one missing yesterday. Sean McMahon has done very well during the league and was good yesterday. And Brian Howard was Dublin's best player by far, sitting deep in that playmaking role. Um, he's he's very, very good at that. But I think if Meade can get enough ball and can throw caution to the wind and go at that Dublin defence, there are kinks in the defence that can be exposed that could make it interesting. But Meade have to prove it. Meade and Kildare, we've been talking them up in different years and it just hasn't happened on the big day. And I've been terribly disappointed by both when you consider the population's and the finance, financial backing in counties like that. Dublin get a lot of criticism for being dominant in the Leinster Championship, and it has become, let's be honest, it's become a bore. But I would lay the blame for a lot of that at counties like Kildare and Mead. Mead, the county that won four All-Irelands in a decade only 20 years ago, have fallen so far. I'd love to see something come out. It's, 30, it's the 30th anniversary of the four games against Dublin in 91. Can they draw inspiration from that? They've nothing to lose by having a go, but don't sit back and try and contain because you're just going to be blown away if you do that. I remember watching the, the Leinster final last, same as that. I, I sort of half tipped them well that they did give Dublin a shot. And like as you said, blown out of the gate, but real naive stuff, like leaving Conor Callaghan standing in the middle of the pitch in his own to catch a ball and work a goal. Like that stuff, schoolboy stuff, you know, for kickouts, just boys not switching. And it was only in the last quarter that they started a bit of physicality, showed a bit of needles, showed a bit of that me grit that they like to talk themselves up about, but they just haven't shown it in the last 10 years. That, that, that's, that's from a time gone by. So from the start, show a bit of physical, show what Wexford done yesterday, a bit of honest physicality and see where it can get them. Well, the funny thing about that final last year was, you know, as Roy mentioned, the goals in the, in the two previous games, they actually had two really good goal chances in the first minute, two minutes. They actually started the first 120 seconds was actually really good. And if they nicked a goal there, that might have potentially kick-started something. Instead, they missed both chances in Dublin, just tore them apart. 
Ulster is an interesting dick as well. Monaghan and Armand both getting the win over the weekend, setting up what looks to be a really intriguing semi-final. I know you were touching on it in your column as well. Huge game for both teams. A, a massive opportunity to potentially win an Ulster title given to Rona, possibly in transition to Nigal. There's question marks over Michael Murphy's fitness. So it makes it even more uh, of a big game. You know, what, what are your thoughts going into that one? No, it, it's huge. And, and, and for anyone not really close to Ulster football, there's, there's two massive backstories. Firstly, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with Monaghan. The Kieran McGinney's record in Ulster, for all the, the DFA and he has in Armagh football, is horrendous. He's there a long time, hasn't delivered at, at, at Ulster Championship level. You know, have had a number of opportunities to, to, to get to finals, uh, to win games that they just fell short. And, you know, so it's a massive one for them. They, they'll probably be going in marginal favourites, I'd say maybe 50 50, um, but they'll be expecting to win that game. They'll, they'll think this is their time. Young players coming, Monaghan seen as a team, maybe on the way down with some of their older established players. If you're going to take down Monaghan in Ulster Championship, granted they beat them a couple of years ago in the back door, but Monaghan were sort of a beaten docket at that stage, sort of tired and, and Wilton in, 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 in the, in the, at the end of Maliki's era. So they'll be saying, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a do or die, it's still a young team, but it's a massive opportunity for them to really get into an Ulster final and to be in a real shout of winning one because coming out of the other side, there's nothing unbeatable coming from, from either Donegal or Tyrone. But it's a massive, massive game for Kieran McGinney that there'll be a lot of pressure on them. There's no point in saying all oh, the pressure's all on. And no, there's pressure on Armagh to, to deliver on the promise because they have some really lovely footballers and great talent up front. On Monaghan's side, you know, Seamus, I was there obviously when, when, when Seamus sort of kick-started Monaghan's fortunes nearly 15, 16 years ago. He never got that Ulster title. He's so badly wanted we had a few near misses in 07 and 2010 he's come back he'd be very sore after losing last year people in Monaghan are all still very sore after losing against Calvin and not getting that path from the Ulster final and worse again having to see Calvin go on and win it, it, it <laughs> so he, he needs to get there to put put those ghosts to bed um, as well Conor McManus Darren Hughes these lads still very important to Monaghan's cause they're not going to be around for too much longer Young lads are coming good, but Monaghan win things when the cards fall at the right time and the old and the young meet and you can do it. Okay, so that's this year. Next year, it could be a, a, a different looking panel. So there's a lot of pressure on Monaghan. Seamus will know this is his time. This is his opportunity to win an Ulster title. So there's a huge amount of offer for both teams. I'm looking forward. I'm raging. I'm down in Kerry for the week. I'm going to miss it. Um, but like it's going to be in the north. It'll be in the six counties. They're allowed to push uh, capacities. God knows how many will squeeze through the gates. You'll do well holding out the Monaghan and Armagh fans if there's a few loose guys in the turnstiles. So it'll, it is the makings, Will, of, of a really cracking tie in the first real big football fixture of the summer. Yeah, Michael, I did te- teed up a lot of the good talking points there. Like even Tomas O'Shea was writing about Kieran McGinney, the Irish dependence about his time in charge. And as Dick says, you can kind of forget, this is the seventh season in charge of Armagh, which is just a, a really long time in modern inter-county football. Like, they're a really interesting team with the attacking talent they have. There is kind of a sense that they could be on the verge of a breakthrough, potentially of joining that maybe that level, maybe just above Dublin and Kerry, potentially. Like, would, would you go along with that notion? Yeah, I think I read somewhere during the week, is this McGinney's 33rd year uh, involved in inter-county between playing uh, Kildare, <laughs> yeah, his role with, with Tipperary uh, hurlers for a year and now with Armagh. Like, that's just phenomenal. To have the appetite to continue to do that and I suppose continue to evolve is, is, is phenomenal. As Dick says, his, his Ulster record is pretty, pretty de- deplorable. And I suppose the thing with Armagh in recent years has been when you expected something, it hasn't delivered. I expected something against Donegal last year and absolutely blown out of water and the game was over a half time. They've loads of attack and a talent um, with, with the O'Neills and Stephen Campbell. They've, they can be cut open easy enough at times at the, at the back and Donegal obviously last year definitely definitely proved that so it's kind of time for them to deliver but as I said there's a bit of pressure probably on them now they didn't even deal with the pressure uh, well at different at different stages yesterday against Antrim and were struggling for, for times there particularly in the first half uh, 
that's yeah, that's a really intriguing game, and because the carrot is so big for the winners, you know, there's a real good chance on the other side of the draw with Murphy's injury to win to win an Ulster. So the carrot for that game is huge, and as Dick said, it, it probably is you know going to be you know the sort of game that could you know kickstart the summer on. So that's definitely uh, one to really look forward to. The injuries to to Conor McManus and Dick might know a bit more, and and Darren Hughes tie injuries uh, generally. Not the, not the quickest to heal so they're going to need both of those at full fitness I, t- I see Dick is sitting back there and has no interest in commenting on the, the, gra- the, the greater severity of them but uh, did uh, like only, for the, only, only enough like. <laughs> for, the, for the sake of the game for the sake of the game and uh, for it to be real as full-blooded and as competitive as you want to be you want neither team missing anyone so hopefully those two boys are both uh, are both fit and ready to take part but that's going to be an absolute belter of a game yeah, and I know Monaghan are mad. Dick mentioned it's the first big game of the summer, but you, even Derry Donegal next Sunday could potentially yep. could potentially be a cracker, especially if Michael Murphy's uh, unable to play. Derry going into that in great form. I said, Roy, the, the big football game of the weekend was probably Galway or Roscommon. Two teams relegated to Division Two. You know, we touched on Galway a couple of weeks ago in that uh, playoff against Monaghan and how they lost their big lead. I don't think Potter Joyce had spoken to the media between then and uh, after yesterday's game. But a vital win for Galway and, and probably the Potter Joyce project generally uh, for them to get back on the on the winning horse. They're now into a Connacht final. So uh, there's a chance of salvage their season. There is. I mean, personally, I'm a, a huge admirer of Potter Joyce. I love the way he played the game. I love his philosophy about the game. But he needed that so badly yesterday. Um, he's invested so much faith in young players and they repaid him in in spades. Um, a bit like Michael Murphy and Donegal, though the game could well be overshadowed by Shane Walsh's injury. I mean, this could be a summer that's about guys who are not there. We spoke about Cluxton earlier, Killian O'Connor being out, Murphy being out. If, if Shane Walsh is to miss a Connacht final, that will have a huge bearing. Um, I think Galway are probably in that place that you talked about, Armagh, they really have to take a step on to prove that they can move to the next step. There's a sense that Mayo are in transition. They've lost so many senior players. Um, they're without Killian O'Connor. And it's an opportunity to win a Connacht. And I think winning a Connacht will take them forward. A Connacht victory over Mayo from where they were two months ago, I think, would be huge. But I think that Shane Walsh situation casts a shadow. He's their, he's their captain. He's a, such a good free taker as a carrier and distributor of the ball. He's, he's in the very, very top class. So while people in Donegal are fretting about whether Murphy should have played and the consequence of that, I think in Galway now it's going to be very similar with Shane Walsh. Yeah, I think that's going to be the story of the summer. People are picking up soft tissue injuries and, and the compressed and tight time frame they have to get back. Dick, I might give you the last word then on, on the Galway Ross Common game. Like, did, did Galway impress you? Like, obviously, probably even mentally after that defeat to Manning, it was very difficult to rebound from it. Do you think that'll still be in their minds at all? Or do you think going into a kind of final, they'll be in a decent place after getting that victory? Ah, no, mentally, the win was really all that matters. Like, they played all the football they needed to play against Monaghan and didn't get the win. So, you, can, you know, you can play all the football that you want. If you don't win, it counts for very little. So, listen, it was a horrendous day. Like, I'd say it was like a, playing like a, like a bottle in, in the hide yesterday with, with the, with the, with the dry weather and then that deluge. So it was never going to be a day for great football. It was going to be a day that you'd see a bit of character in your players and and, and, and dig deep and, and go away done that. And you have to give them great credit. So Paul Joyce and the players will get great heart from that. Roscommon are very disappointing. Like Roscommon are better than that. They've got far better uh, footballers and talent. You could see even that towards the end the frustration and the likes of Jim or Mortis faced when the ball wasn't coming in far too slow and laboured. And that's not the football that we've we've come to enjoy watching uh, Roscommon play over the last couple of years. So that's a very meek way for them to limp out of the championship, especially 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 at home. But that's listen, that's that's for them to deal with. Galway, absolutely. Shane Walsh. Yeah, listen, two weeks depends on the severity of it. But listen, that's that's you just got to play the hand that you're dealt at the minute. You know, Mayo have lost Killian O'Connor. So they're an eye for an eye, let's call it that. So there's no disadvantage to, to, to Galway um, going in against Mayo. Um, if that's if Mayo, are obviously, hopefully going to get by, pa, pa, past Leeds from. So the everything to play for. Another massive card, no different than, than uh, as, as Roy said, our man, Monaghan, um, Park Joyce. He was obviously very hurt after the Monaghan defeat, and rightly so, because it wasn't a good day on the line for him towards the end either. So he, he'll have pulled back a wee bit from that, and it's all, all, all eyes on a, on, a, on a big, big final day for them. 
Yeah, and some really exciting games across all the provinces come over the next few weeks. But for the moment, that's all we have time from the Toronto Podcast in association with Board Gosh Energy. I'd like to thank Dick, Roy, Michael, and John Milan earlier for joining me this week. We'll be back next week with another podcast. In the meantime, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or listen on independent.ie. So until next time, thanks for listening and goodbye. Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the GAA All Ireland Senior Hurling Championship and GAA Legends Tour Series of Crow Park. Hashtag. Hurling to the core.